out there uh, in comment land who have come on here and basically making assumptions about me, who I am, what I do, what I know, and what I don't know. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I forgive you for that because you don't have any clue about correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, about assumption, presumption. That's just what you're going to do. I did the same thing when I was in your position many, many years ago. So here's the history in a nutshell. I'm going to try and be as brief as I can about it. In the summer of 2017, I had concluded a two-year study of the trivium method, and I was looking into common law, UCC codes, all that type of stuff, studying legal, because when I was in high school, way back in the 80s, law was law education was like one of my favorite things, along with English, of course. And I always had an interest in that. But it always seemed to be so overwhelming. The amount of uh, study that I had to do. So there was this channel on YouTube... Uh, there was this trend on YouTube, actually, called Blood Over Intent back then that I was following a little bit. I found it very interesting uh, what these folks were saying. And there was one channel in particular that was, like, the main channel for this movement. And it was called Quasi Luminous. And Quasi Luminous would post all kinds of stuff. And one of the things they posted on the channel was the four or six hour seminar by Marcus Sean Christopher called Tricks and Traps of the Court. If you know anything about this domain, then you've probably seen this video. And I listened to it and I watched it and it really got me interested in what this guy was talking about. Uh, drew me in. I liked the presentation. And so I began looking into what this guy was talking about. Started wondering, what is this quantum grammar stuff? Now, this is the summer of 2017. I'm trying to remember as best as I can. And so I started looking at all the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, everything that was available at the time, and messaging every single individual that had colons and hyphens in their names. Wanting to know more about quantum grammar, wanting to learn quantum grammar. Very few folks responded, and the ones that did, didn't want to teach me. Later on, I find out that probably every single person I contacted None of them knew correct sentence structure, and that's why they couldn't teach it to me. And that was such a mysterious thing for a long time for me, was that all these people are preaching all this stuff about, you're using a fictitious conveyance of grammar, you're using modification, you're using adverbs and adjectives. And then I would ask them, what are you talking about? Explain it to me. And then they couldn't. They couldn't explain it. They would say, just study more. Like, what? <laughs> You're preaching this stuff, but you can't back. And then I began thinking, well, maybe it's a scam. Right? Maybe it's a bunch of BS. 
So I came across Mark Sean Christopher's YouTube channel and I saw a short little video advertisement, I think it was, for his webinars. He offered a 12-week course having to do with all sorts of different topics, but one of the topics was quantum grammar. It was the only person out there advertising classes that had anything to do with quantum grammar. So I contacted him. And I think it was like between 30 and 40 bucks per class for the 12 week course. And you could pay per class. And so that's what I did. I think I came in in the middle of one of his 12 week courses. Um, and this was in 2017, probably end of summer, early fall, I think. And there was probably 20 to 25 people in the class. And we just basically listened to Mark talk. And talk about the Vatican, about the courtroom. And he was basically regurgitating things that he had heard from David Wynn Miller. And so, of course, this brings me to David Wynn Miller and Russell J. Gould. And I began looking at their videos as well and studying their videos. I began downloading their videos, transposing them to MP3s so I could listen to them all day long, thousands of hours of listening while I'm taking this course. And then when Mark gets to the quantum grammar portion of the webinars, which was, I think, week nine or 10 or something like that, or maybe even 11, as a, someone who was an English major, and who had just finished the study of the trivia method, I began to see some red flags with the way Mark was teaching. He wasn't very sure of himself. He could explain par se very well, how you look up a word in an etymology dictionary and look at the meanings and things like that. But he would say like, um, this word means this, if you look it up. And so I look it up, and I see that, yeah, what he says is true. <clears throat> this particular source designates that this word means this particular thing, but there are other meanings as well. What made Mark pick that particular meaning? Right? What, what made him pick that one? <clears throat> what was the logic behind it? What's the baseline? He didn't have one. He was just arbitrarily picking things because whatever, it fit his particular thing that he was teaching, which is fine. It's fine. You can do that if you want to. Me, I like to have a baseline that everyone can understand and follow. And it's not just because I decide it. It's not always like, sometimes it's like that, but the majority of the time, I have a baseline, and that baseline for the meanings of, when I'm looking at the meanings of the words in the context of syntaxing, tangibility and non-tangibility and things like that, the bottom line is looking up the earliest nativity root meaning of the word and going by that. That is the baseline, the baseline, okay? Now, when it comes to meanings of words in a correct sentence structure dictionary, that rule still applies, but also because each individual is different, you may deviate from that from time to time, but that's okay. We'll get it. That, that has nothing to do with this, what I'm talking about now. So Mark had par se knowledge, but he had no syntax knowledge and he had very basic dollar store, <laughs> I don't know any other, other way to put it, correct sentence structure knowledge. Like his, I couldn't understand why in his sentences he would have like for the facts of the facts are something like for the facts, with the facts, by the facts. Like he would have a cause after the verb. I didn't understand why, what? 
It didn't make any sense to me what he was doing. And it wasn't mathematically certified by my cognition of what the mathematical interface was. So then this course came to an end and then, you know, in a week or two, another 12 week course started. And because I wanted to get the full course, I took that one as well. So I took half of the first one and then half and then, and then the whole thing of the next one, the next 12 week course. And this brings me into 2018. In the meantime, that first six week course that or the six weeks that I took, I met a man named Colin Raven hyphen Farhide hyphen Tohidi Colin Efferin. And I, I contacted him because he seemed, there was just something about him. He seemed knowledgeable about this more so than Mark. This is the sensation that I got. And I was correct. And we started talking and he offered to teach me the grammar outside of Mark's courses and stuff. And so we began communicating, messaging, and doing workshops. And he began teaching me the grammar in the winter of 2017, fall and winter of 2017, going into 2018. By February of 2018, I created a YouTube channel and I began doing workshops and teaching people. Keep in mind, I did not have full closure on the grammar at that point. However, Raven, whom I trusted, and I do trust as a, as a tutor, because you have to trust your tutor. If you don't trust your tutor, then what's the point? He said, because my worry was, what if I get asked a question that I don't know the answer to? And Raven said, well, I can be your safety net. To paraphrase, this is basically what he conveyed to me. I can be your safety net. You have any questions, you just contact me. I'll give you the answer. But he really, I think, you know, he thought, he knew that by me teaching it, I would learn, bam, at a very fast rate and get closure on the grammar, which is exactly what happened. So in the meantime, in the meantime, right? In 2017, in the fall of 2017, you get this video from Russell J. Gould which is basically doing a, and I'm putting this in quotation marks, military court marshalling of David Wynn Miller. At the time, I was in contact with David Wynn Miller. I was in contact with Russell J. Gould. I was taking a class from Mark Sean Christopher. And I remember in a Mark Sean Christopher class, he was talking about Sea Pass Sea Treaty. Which, by the way, I find out later, the guy didn't really know anything about. <laughs> Anyways. In the CPAS C Treaty template that Mark offered his students, Russell's name was in there, along with David Wynn Miller's name in the copyright copy claim section of the template. And I remember asking during the webinar, do you, why, why is that there? Is that necessary to have that there? Because at the time, I didn't really know anything about creating document contract postal vessel court venues. I'm, I'm new at this, right? Only a couple months into it. And Mark said, oh, I know what Jason's asking about because there's this stuff that's going on between David and Russell. No, you don't have to have that on there. Um... David and Russell are, are fighting right now or arguing and they're not getting along and blah, blah, blah. Keep in mind at this time, Mark had already come to the United States and met Russell in person. I don't know if he had met David, but he had met Russell in person and actually went to one of Russell's seminars and if you listen to that, I think it's the six-hour seminar that Russell gave where David's not there and they created the quote-unquote quantum media treaty. Mark Cashone Christopher is in that group. You can hear his voice. His autograph is on that contract, the quantum media treaty, lowercase k and all, 
which back then, Russell didn't say anything about the lowercase k, that it was incorrect or not correct. He didn't stop. He didn't say, hey, Mark, you got to fix that, man. No, that only came after David died. And I know pretty much know why that is. But it didn't happen before that. Anyways, so Mark had had contact and knew Russell. And I have to think that he also had contact with David because Mark was working on a, Mark was sort of a liaison between David and a kid, well, a young man from Portugal named Leonardo Edwards, who, if, uh, I guess if you look it up, I think it's called My Baby Was Kidnapped or something like that. Uh, Leonardo's child, I think his name is Santiago, was taken from him and his partner by the social services. For whatever reason, I don't know the reason. I really don't know the reason given. But I do know that Marcus Sean Christopher is the godfather of that child. So he was close in with Leonardo and was working on the case through David Wynn Miller. Leonardo was in contact with David Wynn Miller, and David Wynn Miller was, I'm pretty sure, typing up uh, paperwork using David's version of quantum grammar, sending it over, and then Mark would go to court with Leonardo with this paperwork. Well, folks, it was doomed to failure. Because number one, who's the authority of that paperwork? Look at what word is in the word authority. Author. David Wynn Miller. So if David Wynn Miller is not there in person, then the authority is not there. There is no authority over the paperwork. It's just Mark and Leonardo, and neither one of those people have closure on correct sentence structures, so the whole thing was doomed to failure. Because they didn't, they had no idea how to use it. Or explain what is on the paper. And to this day, Mark still doesn't know anything about the grammar. And this was back in what, 2015, 16, 17? Mark still doesn't know. If you look at the paperwork from the case where Mark is in, in prison for right now, doing seven years, it's in plain, simple English. There's no hint of quantum grammar in that paperwork. None. What's the point I'm making here? Okay, my point is that Mark was in contact with both David and Russell, had met Russell in person, probably David in person as well, and was working with them. And at the same time, getting his business together business courses to uh, do whatever he's doing with that. All right, so to get back on track here, we're in 2018. I began to see that, I began to see red flags, more red flags with Mark. Things weren't quite what they seemed to be. So I began breaking away from him, not taking his courses anymore, um, Oh, one thing I do have to mention, I think it was late in 2017, he also offered a business course, um, which I could, at the time, I could not afford. So I told him that. I said, you know, I can't, can't afford that. Sorry, man. You know, it is is what it is. And he said, you know what? I'll just give it to you. I'll send you the links and you come to the class, okay? And I think there were like five people in that class, in the business class. And in the business class, he talks about, I'm trying to remember what he talked about, buying gold and silver, how to create a YouTube channel, how to utilize algorithms and things like that. And then on top of that, uh, he offered... Um, like a little session with his personal marketer, marketing strategist, which after a little bit of uh, pushing and pressure, he set up a meeting with me and his marketer in which that was 
that was awesome because I learned all about how that marketer's perception of YouTube worked. And so that's what prompted me, one of the things that prompted me to do this YouTube channel. Now, the other thing, the main thing, reason for me creating videos was that when I would watch Mark's videos and I would watch David Wynn Miller's videos and Russell J. Gould videos, they would always explain like how to do things, but they would never say why. They would never explain why. Why is the word T-H-E an adverb? In some scenarios, not always, but in some scenarios. How can it be an adverb here and a verb here and a pronoun there? Why can't it be an adjective? Well, why? Well, that's the main reason why I created this YouTube channel, was to give the why to these things, to fit, put it in that missing piece, add a piece of value to what's already out there. So my first year on YouTube, I got like 100 subscribers by the end of the, the first year. Very slow going. I think the next year, 2019, I had 200 subscribers. But then after that, it, it pretty much took off until now it's kind of leveled out. Almost 6,000, but not quite subs. But I always held true to the principles of trying to stick to the grammar and don't put out any presumption assumptions unless I credential them as such. If I'm giving an opinion or an assumption presumption, I will say, this is my guess. This is my perception of it. This is my viewpoint. But if I'm talking about facts that I can back up, I tell you, that's what it is. And as far as anything having to do with the grammar, those are all facts. I can prove everything I say about the grammar. So I noticed that as I began getting subscribers and gaining a position on YouTube, Mark started reaching out to me via Skype, sending me messages, you know, apropos of nothing, saying things like, we need to meet now. I need to talk to you. Like as if, as if, uh, you know, I'm sure there are folks out there that if they get a, they got a message from him, they came running you know, like, oh, oh, what do we need to talk about? I'm like, what do you mean? So I began responding to the messages, giving Kuliana saying, if you'd like to speak to me, I can set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation. Um, I'll provide the venue. Just email me back. And of course, he would never email me back. Because if he were to do so, then that means he's in my domain and I'm the master of the vessel, not him. And that's something I learned on my own. Um, how to, it's very subtle communication, what we'll call yieldings, all right? Yieldings. There's always a yielding there. And I always, as, as master of my vessel, I always put myself in that position that if you want to learn from me, then you have to contact me. You're my guest, and I'm going to treat you real good as long as you're respectful. As long as you comply with the terms and conditions of my vessel, I will treat you with honor and dignity and grace. But if you don't, then you're out of here. Period. End of story. And it doesn't matter to me if you get offended or whatever, because if you don't understand the subtleties of contract and following, complying with terms and conditions of the vessel of which you are a guest, then you have no business learning correct sentence structure. You don't have the mindset for it because it takes humility. And if you don't have that, then it's probably actually dangerous for you to try and learn this. And you won't learn it anyways, probably.
by my experience of seven years of teaching this. So during this time, 2017, 2018, 2019, I'm in contact with David, Russell, and Mark. So to those out there who are saying, well, if you study Russell J. Gould's video, Russell said that David was purposely misleading Mark. Bro, I was there. I was in the mix. I was communicating with these people. Who, I can't remember who it was that said that. They said that um, David was purposely misleading Mark. Is that like the same thing where David purposely put mistakes in his book and on his website to purposely mislead people? As a tutor, I find that abhorrent. That's disgusting. And I don't feel from my viewpoint, that David did that. I think that there are mistakes all over David's book and website because either he's careless or he just didn't have closure on the grammar. I know that's something that's very hard for a lot of you to accept and comprehend. But then again, you don't have closure on the grammar either, do you? So how could you? You're just navigating on the assumption that the guy did have closure on the grammar. So a teacher, if you're going to claim to be a teacher, oh, look, my views dropped when I said that. That is funny. Ha! Oh, the old protagonist-centered morality thing. Cognitive bias, cognitive dissonance. Ouch. Okay, whatever. A tutor, if they're credentialing themselves as a teacher and they have students, then that means that the teacher has the student's best interest at heart. Correct? Right? They want the student to do good. As long as the student applies themselves, putting forth effort, is humble and comes with an empty cup. Yes, the tutor, it's their duty to do everything they can to make sure that the student does well. Encouraging them to better themselves, to learn the material until they get closure on it. And then, you know, whatever, continuing knowledge cultivation after that. Why would a teacher purposely mislead a student to the point where the student could get into trouble and go to prison. Does that make sense to you? What kind of a person would do that? What kind of an individual would do that? My conversations with David Wood Miller tell me that he wasn't the type of person to do that. Now, I didn't know him as a friend. I would never make such a claim. I didn't know him that well at all. But from my communications with him, he just didn't seem like the type of person that would purposely get someone in trouble. Like purposely hand them enough rope to hang themselves with. Especially someone who had nothing, you know, did nothing to him. Meant no harm. Just an innocent, naive student trying to learn this. And then David purposely misleads them, and then they end up in prison. Now, <clears throat> the individual who said that to me, who said that, well, if you follow Russell J. Gould like I do, then you will know that David was purposely misleading Mark. So what's your authority on this, buddy? Russell? Are you taking Russell at his word because Russell said so? That is that is total BS. First of all, 
As far as Russell goes, knowing what I know about the guy, I wouldn't believe anything that came out of his mouth. He claims to be a judge, right? Well, what, what's the saying that Russell himself has said in the past? How do you know a judge is lying? Their lips are moving. I have never claimed to be a judge of anything. Never have made a public claim of judge. Never. So I wouldn't believe anything that that guy said. But I know there are people out there that hang on every word that Russell says. You know, they, they are members of Russell's cult who, you know, shell out money for to participate in the weekly Russell is Sexy meetings over on Patreon or wherever they, they are now. And they hang on his every word and believe everything he says. Why that is, I mean, that's up to them. That's up to them. But that's kind of like this individual that was commenting. Believing what Russell says. Watch the videos, folks, with Mark and David. David doesn't, when I'm watching that, David is not saying anything that is inherently wrong to Mark about syntax, about, matter of fact, I think I even published a video where Mark is trying to share his syntaxing knowledge and David's looking at him like, are you for real right now? <laughs> Because, I mean, Mark had been studying since, what, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. Five years Mark had been studying, and he still didn't know shit about syntaxing, which is crazy to me. So you folks out there who have not taken workshops with me, there are a thousand free videos on this channel that you can study. And if you've been here for a year or more, and you don't have rudimentary closure on the grammar, then you're not serious about learning it. I'm being straight with you right now. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Until you get serious, you're not going to learn it. And you may be able to get to a point in studying these videos on this channel, maybe about 75% there. But if you want that other 25%, you got to have a tutor. Now, whether that's me or somebody else, that's completely up to you. Right now, I don't really have any other tutors that I recommend because the individuals that I did recommend before, I don't think they're active in the quantum grammar domain anymore. So therefore, I'm not going to recommend anybody other than myself because I can only certify that I know what I'm doing with this grammar. I can't certify if anybody else does or not. Um, oh, my bad, my bad. There are folks out there who can help you if you like a different viewpoint on learning the basics of how this stuff works. And of course, the first man that comes to my mind is my bro across the pond, colon Harry hyphen Charles, colon space Rookslow, full stop. I will say that he is doing things on his own, creating groups and things like that and trying to I guess, make it available, the material available for folks in places where it may not have otherwise been available to get, to try and see if these people, you know, if they're exposed to it, maybe they'll be interested in it and get drawn to it. And then, you know, he can start teaching them or they can be directed to me and I can teach them or, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, and I, I got to say also, this is a channel that is primarily about grammar. That's what I try to stick to. I don't try to, and I don't ever really give out personal information about anyone. Anyone who, I, I know you folks out there don't, the majority of you don't use your correct name on the internet. I know you don't. 
And I understand the meaning behind that, the reason why that. That was like one of the biggest things for me was putting my face out there and then putting my correct name next to the face. Because now suddenly I am accountable for everything that I say when that name is on the screen and my face is here. And so far, I have run into no issues. Even though, supposedly, Russell J. Gould has an arrest warrant for me. Why? I, I don't know, because I'm using correct grammar? That can't be right. He thinks, that to, to the best of my cognition, he thinks that I'm using his technology because he claims it's his technology because he beat the shit, physically beat the shit out of David Wim Miller and forced David to sign over the copyrights of the technology to wrestle. War negates contract. Contract is by consent. If I physically beat you and then you sign a contract so that I stop beating you, that's not a contract. That's an act of war. It doesn't count. It's null and void. By Russell's own teaching. So number one, that copyright is invalid because it's not a correct contract. And number two, the grammar that he uses and the grammar that I use are two completely different things. He uses what I call quantum gobbledygook. Show me any full page document of Russell's and I can point out at least a dozen errors, if not more, on that paper. And I'm not talking about spelling errors. I'm not talking about uh, a missing period. I'm talking about mathematical interface incorrectness. I can show you, and I have done that in the past. So the grammar that he uses is not the grammar I use, so there's no trespass. I'm using correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar with a very specific set of rules, a very specific mathematical interface, and I can prove that again and again and again and again. So, no worries there, Russell. I'm not using your quantum garbly gook. Also, I use the 1 by 1.9 flag. I have never had an issue using it. I've never gotten into trouble using it as a grammar flag, the flag of the land during the time of the contract. I don't modify that flag. I have the constitution for the flag. I don't claim ownership of that flag, no. It's not mine, but I use it. If you have the knowledge of the grammar, then you have the authority to use the flag. If you have the authority over your own documents. That's where the position of peace and neutrality comes in. All right. Now, if you look at Russell's documents, at least, I don't know if he does it anymore, but for the past few years, he's been putting a spear on top of the one by 1.9 flag, which voids the constitution and neutrality of that flag. It's no longer a correct sentence structure flag. It's something else now. It means he's at war with the people. That spire. He's even said that in videos where he said, if you walk into the Secretary of State's office, you see a spire on the top of the flag, it means they're at war with the people. Well, I guess the same thing applies to you, doesn't it? One and one is one. All right. So that's my position on this, folks. Wish I could stay and uh, talk more about this. But I just wanted to give you noobs out there a little bit of data about me and where I fit into this stuff. Because I do, and I was a part of the story. I've been in this for a while, since the summer of 2017. If you ever feel like doing your own research and putting the work in, there are a thousand videos or so on this channel right here that you're watching that are free. My gift to you. Yes. Yes, I do workshops. I have a curriculum. Class 1, Class 2, Class 3, Class 4. I have a bunch of classes that you can take if you want to get closure on this grammar. But that's in the confidential. 
email me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and apply for a workshop. Please include your full correct name. However, everything that I teach in those workshops is available for free on this YouTube channel. Everything. I don't hold anything back. There are no secrets as far as the grammar goes. Now, I'm not going to get into specifics about flag mechanics or banking mechanics or postal mechanics or things like that. No, that comes after you establish the foundation of grammar, which is available for free right here on this channel. And I think that that little, that little morsel is what has kept me safe all these years because obviously I'm not trying to make money or get rich off of this stuff because it's all for free right here on YouTube. It's not behind a paywall. So that establishes my volition. I thank you for being here. I'm going to take the best bits of this video and publish it to the public. And of course, the full unedited version will be available in the members only section, loyalist contributors tier two section. Thank you for joining me. See you soon.